talk strength training for hypertrophy this week let's dive into some nutrition protocols for hypertrophy so i I think the difference is obvious from fat loss and hypertrophy but at least break us break it down with the difference between fat loss and hypertrophy right off the bat surplus not deficit boom you take anything from this surplus surplus in calories to start that's pretty easy obvious not necessarily a surplus in protein right Mm -hmm. so we talked about this with nutrition and fat loss, that universally protein is going to be this gram per pound, right? And right. people speculate like 0.8 per gram, 0.8, maybe even above. Let's not overcomplicate it. I think if we need to figure out this net nitrogen balance, right? This idea that if I have more amino acids and more protein circulating in my body, that I will either preserve or build muscle is the foundation. We need to figure out what is that? And we need to establish that. And we start off with just a, a number, right? Hey, get into gram per pound of body weight. And we start to look at your body comp and we start to look at your lean muscle mass over time. Pretty easy, right? The net nitrogen loss means that I'm losing more protein than I'm, than I'm gaining. And that usually is a product of not having enough calories, but also not having enough protein or amino acids in general. So top of the line, let's start there. Let's keep it simple, stupid, right? Let's look at this from this lens of a lot of people are going to struggle with all the inundating of information. Get one gram per pound of body weight and see. And what that looks like is if I weigh 200 pounds, 200 grams of protein, and that's four calories per gram of protein. Very simple. So that's 800 calories coming from that. And if I need to get 3,200 calories to be in a surplus, okay, then 800 of it is going to come from protein. So the rest is going to come from carbs and fat. And how did I get to a 3,200 number, right? So hopefully we have a good kind of baseline of one gram per pound of protein is going to be where I'm going to start for my protein intake. And that's the calories I'm going to get from that. And then I'm going to look at it from being in a surplus caloric wise, 16, to 18 times my body weight, right? So I weigh 200 pounds, 3,200 calories all the way up to 3,600 calories. Okay. That, that's, that's pretty good. Okay. So I, I didn't even know that was the math off the top of my head. And I'm glad I came out that, that smooth or that seamless, God, that but was... I have to get in yeah, 3,200 calories minus 800 from carbs and fat. And one of the things that I think is so important to know is protein in our body. Yes, it has a contractile element, but it's also the storage of glycogen or glucose in our body. So if we're looking at, okay, I want to contract, probably the better thing to think about from building muscle is understanding if I can store more glycogen. That if my body is capable of storing more glycogen, by default, I have more muscle mass. Like, I think that framing is important because what it doesn't do is stigmatize carbohydrates. It doesn't create this relationship where people are feeling as though they can't build muscle while staying at a low body comp, right? This dirty bulk or this concept of you're going to have to exchange one for the other. Like you either get massive at all costs, or you stay relatively lean all year, but you're never really putting on more muscle. And one of the things that I think is so multivariate and so complex, but if we sacrifice maybe something like carbohydrates or energy from actual food, which is going to be the simplest, most linear path to getting energy from our food, like carbohydrates is glucose. That's what it really is. It's a combination of monosaccharides, disaccharides, polysaccharides, which is the more the storage of that. So if we could break down any food substrate into individual small components, right? We got protein to peptides, to amino acids. We have carbohydrates to, or to polysaccharides, to disaccharides, to monosaccharides, which are simple sugars, glucose being the primary one. And then we start to look at that from, all right, I start to ingest this stuff and I ingest it as this poly and then it breaks down into a mono. And then I store it in glycogen, which is again, another polysaccharide. And that storage of that glycogen is simply put the most important thing for building muscle. That if I look at it from, okay, proteins off the, we already established protein is going to be there, right? With net, net positive nitrogen balance, we have enough amino acids for not only energy, but to build proteins, right? Because inside the cell, the mitochondria takes RNA and then DNA and then takes these amino acids and forms new proteins, right? All good. But the trigger for that is the availability of glycogen. And if I have have glycogen in my body, my body feels like it's in a surplus. 
and I have more of a response by building more muscle tissue, especially if there's a direct need following a workout. So one of the things that I want everyone to kind of get comfortable with here and like sit down, relax. I heard all this stuff about, oh man, I should omit certain food groups or I shouldn't eat a carb or I shouldn't do this or that. You have to look at this objectively that if you want to build muscle tissue, because this is what we're talking about here, we're carpentmalizing the goal for the sake of just simplifying this for hopefully the hope for the people listening is all of us want to get massive. Like we want to look like, we want to look like Lee Priest in the early 2000s and Phil and Jay Cutler in the mid 2000s and then Phil Heath in the 2020s, right? We want to look like those guys. Just to say we do, most ar argumentatively. How will we get close to them is understanding that we need to have a actual focus on carbohydrates around training. We need to deplete the muscle of glycogen, and that's the central part of our, our actual training. And then we need to restore, rebuild that muscle by building back in glycogen. And then we super compensate because we have to build more tissue to support that glycogen that we think we might need in the future. And the best way to replenish glycogen is then having carbohydrates. And here's the other kicker. The more it's in a simple form, i.e. a higher glycemic means that we break it down quicker, right? Because that's all high glycemic is. It's we break down these, this carbohydrate that we take in because it's more in a simple form, a monosaccharide form. And that releases more insulin from the pancreas. And the pancreas shuttles that glucose to the muscle, goes through this thing called a GLUT4 transporter, which takes that glucose and enters the cell. And that cell builds up into a glycogen. And we start to go through not only hypertrophy of the muscle cell, but increasing our storage of our energy within our body, which is in a form of glycogen. And we need to get this, I guess, concept across of, we're going to subtract protein from the equation and we're going to look at the rest of their calories coming in the form of carbohydrates and fat. And majority of that is going to come from carbohydrates. Then we're going right. to look at a scale of weight loss, weight gain, and the 100% calories I have between carbs and fat minus my protein for my total caloric intake. 75% of that is going to go probably towards carbohydrates from a weight gain. And then 75% of that's going to go towards the weight loss. So we're just tipping the scale that we're just subtracting, working with smaller numbers, and we're looking at this thing in front of me, like, oh, you wanna gain muscle? You wanna look like Phil Heath? Sweet. Let's get you 800 calories from protein, 200 grams of protein, and then we're gonna get you the remaining, so 800 minus 3,200, so I'm just talking about me for, for instance. So I have 2,400 calories left, right? 75% of that, which is gonna be what? What's that, Corey, 1,600 calories? Sure. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, <laughs> let's go with it. 1600 calories. And then I look at it from, okay, well, divide that by four. So that's 400 grams of carbs. And the rest of those calories, that 800 calories, which is nine grams per, or nine calories per gram. So I have that remaining, my cal, remaining from that 2400 going in the form of carbohydrate or going in the form of fat. Now I only have a, I hopefully have a net positive nitrogen balance from my protein intake. Now I have a high capacity to replenish and build up glycogen. We got to get the simpler for everyone out there, but I just rattle off a pretty high level physiology course and biochemistry course and macronutrients and nutrition. But simply put, slam me against the wall, Corey, just tell me what I need to know. We need to have enough protein to build muscle and we need to focus more on carbohydrates as opposed to fat when I'm trying to build muscle. I think we talked about it in our fat loss nutrition uh, protocols episode is like carbs are anabolic. That's going to be our main driver of anabolism or building up of <clears throat> muscle cells, right? One thing I wanted to dive into is you mentioned specifically carbs around training. So could you mm -hmm. dive into what, what nutrition should look like pre intra post specifically for hypertrophy here? Yeah. I love the idea of building your nutritional around your workout that mm -hmm. that to me is foundational for working with clients because it's going to do two things one they're working out you know <laughs> you know that's pretty simple low-hanging fruit but two and this is also really interesting is you start to frame your day right you start to look at it from okay well I'm, 
I'm going to get maybe 20 grams of protein before I work out. I'll get 10 grams of amino acids when I work out. And then I'm going to get 40 grams of protein afterwards. And I count amino acids if I'm supplementing amino acids as protein. It just, it just makes life a little bit easier, right? You know, I know they're not a complete protein, but it's nice to say that. They're the, they're the muscle building complete protein, in my opinion. So I got 20, 10, 40. Okay, I got 70 grams right there. Okay, I got to get 200 grams in a day. You just got to worry about 130 grams from somewhere else. Like, it's all you got to do. All right, then I look at it from... Okay, I want majority of my carbohydrates coming within that workout window as well, right? I want to have enough carbohydrates that I have enough energy during my workout, but that I don't have a blood sugar crash. And maybe it's from a more complex source. Maybe it's from something that's a little slower digestion, but not too slow because I want that energy to be present during the workout and not a whole lot of fiber because I don't want to have GI distress, not a whole lot of fat because that slows down gastric emptying. Okay, and then not a gross amount of protein because when we do eat a lot of protein, that creates a lot of blood flow to our stomach and our actual gut, and that may make us nauseous. So we want to figure out, okay, I want to get enough protein before I work out to have my amino acid pool topped off. I want to have enough amino acids during my workout to have energy and not utilize muscle as energy. But then I look at it from a carbohydrate standpoint, I want to have enough glucose, maybe, comp maybe a little bit more disaccharide, more complex carbohydrate, but I can digest it quickly to use it for energy. And the window, maybe an hour to 30 minutes, within 30 minutes of that workout. And then I work out and then, yeah, I'm going through a pretty high glycogen depletion workout. So maybe I want to supplement with some sort of carbohydrate during my workout, like a, a simple sugar, like a maltodextrin, dextrose. There's plenty of good supplements around that. Maybe you're just a good sports drink. And then post-workout, that's when I really want to crank. I want to look at it. Okay, I want to have a two-to-one protein to carb ratio on the low end if I want to build muscle. Like I would even get into a three to one. And it's kind of contingent upon how simple is that sugar and how quickly digestion it is, right? We look yeah, at no. things like maple. Protein, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. You said protein to carb. I think you meant carb to protein, more carbs, right? Yeah, two to one, okay. two to one carb to protein ratio. Sorry, right. yep. yep. Maybe even three to one, mm -hmm. right? So if I'm getting in 40 grams of protein, that means I need at least 80 to 120 grams of carbohydrates. So if we're doing the math at home, I'm getting 70 grams of protein. I've just subtracted 70 grams from your 200. And then I got to get 400 grams of carbs, which is 1,600 calories. I probably got close to 200 grams right there around my workout. I just made your day in life a lot easier. But you got to get the workout in. You got to put, you got to go work out. Like, and that's the part for me, I think, is a lot of folks, like, as they start to, like, what's your secret? How do you get people such great results? Like, I just make it easy on them. And I'm talking to you person out there, don't make it harder than yourself. Like you don't have to do these incredibly complex things that you get the Spartan S like approach. Like you don't have to curate and create your own milk from having cows in your backyard. You know, right. you don't have to go on the, the dark web to find breast milk. Like we don't have to do these lengths. Like it's okay to find habits and loops and make it easy in certain things. Like, damn, like 1600 calories from, from carbohydrates a lot. Well, cool. could you eat 400 grams? Oh yeah, I could do that. It's the same amount, but it's just easier to conceptualize. Like that's my point here. Oh, hey, can you get a window of time where we're going to get a pre intro and post and we'll get supplements and we'll make it a little easier on you. I'll just tell you what to eat beforehand. And then that's going to knock out roughly half of all your carbs and protein intake throughout the day. And the rest of the day, you just make sure that you have some sort of starch, some sort of protein, some sort of veggie at every single meal. Yeah, I could do that. Okay, great. We are going to be in an anabolic state now going forward. And that goes into the rest of the meals. Balanced, having enough micronutrients from fruits and vegetables, having enough protein through there. Because there is another element here that we, we didn't talk about in our weight loss as much as we probably, maybe people would like, but this idea of windows of, of fasting. And I would say this. It's probably more important to hit a caloric number and a macronutrient number than to hit a certain period of not eating, especially if the goal is muscle building. Whatever exchange we get from increased growth hormone and testosterone from fasting is not offset by being in a deficit. And I wanna say that in a different way, that if your goal is building muscle, your priority is calories and macros, not whatever maybe small bump in endocrine, because you're not, it's not steroids. Right. But if you get a, Per 0.001% increase in testosterone or growth hormone, well, that will not offset being in a 25% deficit from calories from being an extremely small window or not having your amino acid pool completely topped off throughout the day. 
so you, you're not training pennies on the dollar here. Like we just need to be conscious of whatever percentile change we're hoping to get from intermittent fasting. And if our goal is building muscle is completely negligible, comparatively speaking, eating a certain calorie amount and macronutrient count and timing it day in, day out. Like, let's not just, let's not prioritize the wrong thing here because maybe we just got bamboozled or hoodwinked because we thought that would be nice and logical, right? And it's a nice idea on paper, but it's very, very small. And the other part that's going to be more impactful to your growth hormone and testosterone is training and training really hard and training consistently really hard. You know, that that is now, you're talking 0.0000001% compared to speaking to whole percentage points of change from testosterone production. Like, let's not, let's not prioritize the wrong thing. It's the path of least resistance, usually the path that takes a lot longer to get somewhere. Like, just be honest. Right. One thing I wanted to potentially touch on is what if I don't want to look like Jay Cutler? I'm thinking specifically for maybe some of our female listeners out there who are worried about getting way too big. What would you say to them? You're wrong. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you're wrong. Yeah, yeah, you're Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a you problem. So let's just, let's just say how it is. You won't, you know, <laughs> like... You know, like it just, it's just leveraging a, an approach that they did to reach these incredible lengths. That's all it is, right? You know, if I want to, if I go and try to do a marathon and I look at the best marathoners in the world and I'm worried about, man, I hope I don't get down to five foot four, 120 pounds. I think that's a very unrealistic thing. You know, <laughs> like it just, it ain't going to happen, right? They were talking decades of physiology. We're talking... We're talking different endocrine systems from male, female. We're talking extreme focus and dedication to an outcome, right? Like the lengths at which they had to get to being 300 pounds and 4% body fat is infathomable. Like it's just not something normal people can comprehend. And the sacrifice they have to make day in, day out, year in, year out is something that is quite frankly just uncomprehensible to normal people. So your fear and your, your, I guess, notion that there is a small percentile chance you become a fraction of that. I think it's completely offset by the health and the improvement of that. But we're, we're talking about in simplistic terms of leveraging a model, a very compartmentalized model of what the best in the world do at building muscle tissue. And we're just trying to leverage that maybe potentially for a period of time towards a greater overall goal, better health and function. And I think that's the point here. It's if I want to learn how to become the fastest human being in the world, or if I want to be able to run the greatest distance, it behooves us to look at some of the best in that world and what they would do in that situation. But knowing that's part of a more comprehensive and overall approach to health and exercise that I don't think you should be that concerned with, right? And again, it's the, the concept of like, man, I would really – love to become more wealthy, more wealthy. And I start to look at Warren Buffett and man, I really want to follow his life to a T. I'm going to drive to McDonald's and I'm going to count to the penny of every single thing I do every single day and make sure I spend within my means. And I'm going to go to work and I'm going to sit in office. I'm just going to get spread table, spreadsheets and tables every day until 5 PM, go home, have a, have a microwave meal, go to watch the ticker report and then go to bed and then rinse, wash and repeat. Like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, like, I don't want to be a billionaire, you know, like, I just don't want to do that. Like you won't have, you can't, you won't, like you're not going to be, you can get a little bit richer and you can take some things that he does and he does really well, but you won't be a billionaire. Like you'll, you'll be a little bit richer if you follow some of the things he does, because you won't be able to do what he does day in, day out. You just don't have that level of dedication and focus and that's okay. Maybe we're more well-rounded and you want a more of a, the, what you value in life is be able to get better at something and not being the best at something. And there's a difference there. Like I want to improve my body comp. I want to be healthier. I want to have, I want to be able to spend time with my friends and family. I want to travel. I want to do things that comes at the sake of not looking like Jay Cutler or being as rich as Warren Buffett. And that's okay. Right. You know, that's I think that's, yeah, I think that's the part that's probably so foundational of all this. Like we're just, it's a model and it's just, we're just, so we're just isolating it to really understand and unpack what they would do in that situation and trying to just take the best from that and understand it fits into a bigger picture with us. 
So we talked training and organizing our nutrition around our training specifically. Is there any difference between a training day versus a non-training day and what nutrition might look like? Say if I'm on a three-day total body type yeah. workout plan. I would look at averages, right? So if I look at the average from a day, average from a week, I would look at it from the bigger picture of what's a week look like? Right. And I could say, okay, well, that person averages 3,200 calories a day, 200 grams of protein, 400 grams of carbs, and then 75 grams of fat every day. Like death, death taxes in that number. And then we start to look at it from, they have wild variances. Training days, it's easy. I get half my carbs and carbs and protein around my training window. Okay. Like that's the easy control, but Hey, I got an off day. And then the wheels come off the hinges on that day. And I drop my calories by half. I don't eat anywhere near my protein goal. And what is the residual off of that, right? Does the average of the week completely outweigh the, the poor days? And then the psychological impact of that, of I just needed a day not to be like a robot and count and measure my food and have this very dialed in approach to every single thing I'm doing. Like, I get it, I get it. So there's a... A very much so, I like, we have to evaluate the trade-off from that, but I would say treat it like batting average in baseball, that you want to bat 800 every single day, and you want to be within a certain amount of that, regardless if you're training or not training, to deem this net positive, because if we have a stream drop in protein, probably means that your body is not going to be as efficient at building new proteins, and we build protein when we recover, or when we're resting. We don't build it during the workout. So anabolism is going on outside of the gym. And if we have days that we're not working out, that we completely take everything away from what we're doing from nutritionally and have a huge variance from our caloric intake and our macronutrient macronutrient intake, I find that's going to be disruptive to the overall goal. And we might still get there. It just might spread it out to being longer. So I have a certain acceptable deviation from the normal plan. Like I can get within 25% of my protein goal, not going to be the end of the world. But if I only get to 25% of it, so I'm supposed to get in 200 grams and only get in 50, I find that might actually be problematic, especially if we start to build that up over time. And one of the things that I find too, of this notion of cheat meal, like the idea that I am tolerating eating this way to be able to eat the way I really want to do, eat the way I normally want to eat is emblematic of what's going to happen when we stop dieting to build muscle or lose weight. That I will default to whatever that cheat meal is because that's my norm. That's what I, that's my normal eating pattern. It's really crappy food, very satiating, very hedonic, and I just tolerate this other stuff because I have to. And what I would say in that situation is that's that's understandable and normal, but you need to find a way to close the gap from having this great disparity in foods that you eat for a purpose and a goal and having almost a tumultuous and, and resentful relationship with and figure out how to enjoy it more and make it more, more of a social aspect or more part of something you would eat anyway, normally, like you should learn to like the foods that you're eating. And it doesn't have to be bland and tasteless and doesn't have to be completely devoid of any enjoyment. If you can figure a way to close that gap. And I was just having a really great conversation with a close friend of mine about ways to take a really beneficial supplement and make it enjoyable. And I have a great litmus with my kids and I, I try to eat as healthy as humanly possible. And I try to build my cupboard and my fridge with only things that I think would be deemed as healthy. And we're like normal everyday family of like, you pick your battles, you fight your fights. And I find ways to prepare the foods that I'm eating that they go, oh, okay, I like this. And I kind of have a great indicator of the psychological impact of someone that may be potentially dieting going through this. I'm like, okay, well, let's say that I want to get a non-insulin impacting starch like you can into their diet. And they're like, ah, it doesn't really taste that good in a shaker bottle. But I blend it and maybe I freeze it and I turn it into an ice cream. And they're like, oh, wow, this is actually really good. The consistency, the texture, it's really good. I can eat this every day. Isn't that a win? It's a huge win. And when we look at it from this like non-training day versus training day, back to the original question, it's filling in stuff in their day that would eat when they're not training or when they're not directly dieting for a purpose all throughout the day. So it doesn't change anything, right? That we have a normal business. You usually wake up, we eat the certain things and you get this Pavlovian response certain times too. Like I can tell you firsthand when you get momentum, 
of eating certain foods every single day, your body starts to crave those foods, right? And I, I will tell you definitively moments that I craved oatmeal with raisins and egg whites every morning I woke up. And I have this like weird reaction to it. I'm like, oh, I actually really like that meal. It's comparatively speaking to an omelet with sourdough toast or and bacon and eggs, like I, probably not nearly as palatable. And nine out of 10 people will probably tell you I prefer the omelet and sourdough, sourdough bread and bacon. And they're probably right. But I would tell you in the moment when it was pretty heavy in that egg white oatmeal type of thing, like, eh, it'd be a tough, it would actually be a tough call. I wouldn't mind getting that if I went out to eat. And I think that's the part too. It's like, not because I'm robotic or I'm just psychotic with my diet and what I'm doing. It's I'm conditioned myself to go, I enjoy these foods. And when I get to a day off or when I'm not really, you know, trying to improve my body comp or I'm still going to default to those foods because I like them. And that's what I think you should strive for. Whatever the goal, weight loss, weight gain, you should strive to get foods that you would generally enjoy that are going to be generally healthy. And I think that's how you have a better relationship with food. You don't have this toxic, this is, I'll just tolerate this for a period of time until I get to Friday and then the wheels will come off. Or, man, I hate eating like this. I can't stand it. Then find better ways to prepare your food. You know, it's just my simple thing. So when you get to that day off or that hard week, right? We talked about this weight loss. Thursday's coming. You got to get the kids. You got to do a whole bunch of other stuff. How are you going to react? You react by preparing and being in a good situation to handle it. And the same thing with this. If you're just eating foods that you like that are prepared the way you like them, that you can eat regardless of your dieting or not. That seems like a mic drop moment right there. Right? That's it. You got to condition yourself. a baby. <laughs> you got to condition yourself. like Joe Cutler. Yeah, why don't you? Yeah, exactly. Your tension What's potential will drop to nothing if you don't have the right amount of carbs and protein around your workouts. It's so simple. Outcomes, like not Cutler. solutions. <laughs> I'm going to keep Thanks, hammering Sam. this. I'm going to keep Forever. hammering this. Forever and ever. And hey, make sure you, you re leave a review. What the hell? We need more reviews, everybody. Step up. We need it, man. This is the best podcast on the internet, and you guys are you guys got to talk about it. Share with your friends. Thank you, yeah. Corey. Tell tell everybody. No, I know. This yep. could save right, someone's life. <laughs> All right, buddy. See you, bud.